I want to show you um, something about C. I also wanted to talk a bit about the toast problem. So I was really pleased that everyone, um, so many, oh, uh, nearly everyone put a whole lot of effort into solving it and wrote vast amounts of stuff trying to estimate the number of pieces of toast that it would take to fill up this lecture theater. Can I just talk briefly a little bit about the process you went through, um, just because it might be interesting for you. And I might give you a more full breakdown when I've read the other. I've still got 200 and something of them to read. I'm noticing answers are falling into a few different categories. Can we just go back to the whole scoping thing again? You walk into a room and you scope it out, or you reach a learning situation, you scope it out. You're a computer programmer or an engineer or something like that, and you see a problem, you've got to look at it with problem eyes and start scoping it out. When you're scoping out a problem, you have to think what's important about this problem. You cannot think all problems are the same or equal. Every problem's different and needs different things to think about. What I felt was interesting about that problem was I asked you how many pieces of toast would fit into the room. Yet less than half of the people gave me a number. The question wasn't asking for a method, though I said methods are interesting and try as many methods as you can. The point of the exercise was finding a number. Now, a lot of people even came up with a good method, but I think were too nervous to calculate a number or found the number too hard to calculate or said, I'd calculate it if I had a calculator with me or a computer. But it's like, you know, Apollo 13 and the Houston, we have a problem and the, the Got to join two bits of pipe together, but they don't quite fit, and they need a coupling ring, and they don't have a coupling ring. They don't go, Houston, we've got a problem. We need to somehow get these two cables to join, and we don't have a coupling ring. And Houston, it's not good if Houston calls back five hours later saying, yeah, yeah, we worked it out. No, we want the answer. <laughs> we don't just want to know you know how to do it. So I, I really admired the people that gave me an answer, even though everyone gave quite different answers. If it was a democracy, the number would be about five million, I should say. But I had a huge range of answers up and down. But I'm very proud of anyone. I'm proud of everyone, okay? Even if you didn't give me an answer, it's great. But just bear in mind, this problem was to come up with a number, and it was an estimation problem. So we wanted, not in a perfect world, how you would have solved it. We wanted to know a number. Now, what made the problem interesting was you shouldn't have had any computation devices, though, of course, many of you do. So it needed to be something you could work out in your head or on a scrap of paper. You didn't have much time, so you needed to do it quick. So if you had a method of working it out that would take hours, it wasn't appropriate for this problem. I asked you in a lecture. You had a couple of minutes to do it. So you've got to think of, well, what's the best I can do in a couple of minutes? A lot of people did funny things. And funny's fine, OK? Uh, like, uh, they said things like, uh, well, it depends on the size of the toast, of course, so I'd say one, given a really big piece of toast. <laughs> and that's cool. Um, but then they stopped. And that's not a good place to stop. It's good to be funny, but you know, again, going back to Houston, we have a problem. Uh, they go, I can fix your problem for you. Don't worry, it's Houston here. Uh, all you need is a piece of toast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, we'll get a piece of toast. Yeah, yeah, five minutes later. Yeah, we've got bread and we cooked it with the last of our oxygen. We've got a piece of toast. Now, this will only work if it's a piece of toast exactly the size and shape and strength as a coupling ring. <laughs> in theory, that is a solution, but they didn't have a piece of toast like that. So we also wanted to know probably a whole range of answers, but we really wanted to know how many pieces of toast would fill. Now, it's an odd-shaped room. So a lot of people did very elaborate calculations trying to work out the volume of the room. So... So it's interesting and clever to do that. A lot of the, the, I'd say the most common answer was someone saying, I've worked out the volume of a piece of toast, and I, if I worked out a volume of the room, then I just have to divide the two, and that would tell me, which is a reasonable strategy and certainly a school-type solution to the problem. It's clever because you're both essentially solving the problem by relating it to a standard. You've got a standard unit, like a metre or a centimetre. You find toast in terms of this unit, metres or centimetres. You find volume in terms of this unit, metres or centimetres, you're cubic. Um, and then you can relate them to each other because you've got this sort of standard. But the problem was I didn't give you any measuring gear. So some people did clever things by working it out in terms of my height. I said I estimated how big I was and they were estimating my height and things like that. But I, so it's no good knowing that you could work it out if you had a theodolite or a tape measure because you don't and you didn't. And you had to work it out then just by looking around. So I'm not saying these answers are bad. I'm just thinking you shouldn't stop with that. And there's a big danger in the get the two numbers and divide approach that um, 
I guess as a computer scientist is clear to me, but probably isn't clear to you guys yet. And which is, well, can anyone guess? What's the problem with getting, working out the volume of the room and the volume of the piece of toast and dividing? What's, scoping out the problem, and just as a big picture problem solving strategy, what's the danger of that approach? Oh, yeah, the toast might be malleable, but I reckon rounding errors will, <laughs> rounding errors. I reckon, I reckon, yeah, that's a problem, but I don't think that's a killer problem because we, we, we're accepted we're going to get an approximate answer. So that's a good idea. That's a good idea, but let's suppose we, you know, I just like to know how many zeros are at the end. That would make me happy. Is it a million or a thousand or 10,000 or 10 million? You know, within a scope. Six million? Yeah, yeah. Um, the error in measurement um, gets increased if you divide it. Well, yes, that's, thank you, thank you. Um, it's an error danger. You've got two very big numbers that you don't have much intuition for. You're dividing them. The error is multiplying. You know, the, the effective error is when you multiply or divide numbers is to multiply the errors. At the end, you're going to come up with a number, and you are going to have no sense at all if it's right or not. You are going to have no gut feeling if that number is right or wrong, even by a factor of 10 or 100. You're just trusting. There's no fail-safe. There's no reasonableness check. Now, in computing, we always want to have a reasonableness check, in engineering too. We, always, we call it a test in computing. We work out a test at the beginning that the program is going to have to pass if it's right, and at the end, we verify that it passes the test, some sort of independent way, triangulation, so you get two looks on the answer so you can double check. Because if you've got a zero wrong or two zeros wrong, you're not going to tell with that divide method. So although it's a perfect textbook method is not a very practical method in the sense that it's dangerous in the sense that if you make a mistake, you're not going to know or notice. Can I tell you the best answer that I saw so far? There's nothing wrong with that technique. Can you see in, in a case where you're an architect and you've got a theodolite and you can calculate the volume of the room perfectly and things like that, that way is okay. But I want a reasonableness engineering thing so you can tell me is it roughly a million, is it roughly 10 million? And I want you to have a feeling at the end that, yep, that's about right, or nope, that's not. Here's the, here's the best one I've seen so far. Not the best, but the one that made me really excited. The people did all sorts of clever maths approximations. The, everyone did something clever in different ways. I was very pleased with everyone. I'm not putting anyone down, but can I just put this person up? And their name is Tim. Tim, is that you, Tim? <laughs> it's Tim, it's Tim. Uh, do you mind if I read out your answer? Okay, what Tim said is this. He said, look, one piece of toast is roughly equivalent to a piece of bread. This is a very short answer. This is his answer. 20 pieces of bread is roughly a loaf. Oh, do you have the loaf up there, Theo? It's roughly 20 pieces of bread to a toast. He said, oh, thanks, Andrew. I don't know, how many are there? That is about roughly 20. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh-oh. Probably 25, but okay. We're just doing, we're just doing ballpark stuff. So there's 20 pieces in a loaf, and now he's dealing in a unit of a loaf, and a loaf is a much more familiar size. And he said, I reckon there's about 28 loaves in a book box. 28's an odd number, but you, by a book box, you're thinking like one of those packing boxes you use to pack books. Yeah, okay. And what, how did you get 28? Uh, five, by five by four? Yeah. Seven by... Like five by four, and then you can add them long ones as well. Oh, you can put some in long ones. I was imagining how many of these you could pack in a box, a box he knew really well. He had a strong intuition for that box. He had a strong intuition that it's about 30 of these will fit in one of those boxes. And I know those boxes, and I reckon it's about right. Probably about 30 of these will fit in one of those boxes. So already we know that roughly 30 times 20, roughly 600 slices of bread fit in a box. And we're confident of that answer because I really believed every step of his process. Yeah, about 20 slices that make a bread. Yeah, about 20 loaves fit in a box. And then he said, how many boxes fit in a, a shipping crate? You mean like one of those really big portable things they have at the airports or on backs of trucks? And you said 5,000 boxes in a shipping crate. I've got less intuition here. Why did you think 5,000 boxes in a shipping crate? I don't know. Okay. That might be the weak link in our chain. But can you see what he's doing? He's relating each thing to something he knows about. So you, you might have thought how many wide and how many long and how many high. I'd have maybe gone to something even smaller than a shipping crate. And then he's thinking how many of those shipping crates would sort of fit in here? And how many do you guys reckon? Five. Eight, six, ten, some people think. He thought four. Okay, so maybe he's out by a factor of two, but can you see you're all in the, in the ballpark sort of thing? So he multiplied all those numbers together, and that gave him roughly uh, about 10 million pieces of bread. Now, I don't know if that answer's right or not, because I haven't worked out the answer yet, because I didn't want to telegraph anything to you guys by working it out. But I do know that he can verify every step, except possibly the 5,000 boxes in a shipping crate. 
He can verify that and apply a reasonableness check to it. So at the end, he's got a number that he's reasonably confident with. There's not a ridiculous number. So I know now that 10 million pieces of bread is not a ridiculous answer for the number of pieces of bread to fill this room. I don't know if it's right or not, but can you see why I really like that method? Whereas some people have just did a whole lot of calcs and then at the end said, 17,952,718.4. I'm thinking, okay, maybe that's right, but I have no way of knowing. And computing is all about things going wrong in subtle ways that you never notice. Because the computers do so much so fast. And just one little slip somewhere buried there in instruction 9 million that it executes being out by one decimal place. One little mistake can have this massive snowballing effect by surprise later on and get, catch you completely unawares. So we're obsessed with making sure that things are correct and work and having reasonable as checks. But yeah, testing correctness. Does that make sense? So everyone did it. And the other thing that I was um, interested to notice is that no one, in including Tim, actually did any reasonableness checking at the end. No one tried more than one method that I could see. No one had an argument why their answer should be correct. Uh, and these are all things that I hope will eventually become second nature to you. Um, so now let's just quickly go to um, C, the language C, which is the language we'll be using in this course, the computing language. Um, we've been looking at this machine code on the board here. So machine code is like one level of abstraction. At one level, the computer is executing machine code. But you saw how hard it was to even write a program to add two numbers together. It's just a whole lot of gibberish in numbers. What's the problem with gibberish and numbers? What's the problem with this as a program? Well, can you look at it and see it's correct? Do you have any sort of sense that this is the right program? If I change that to a seven, would you, you know, you just, there's no intuition associated with this. It's too complex. There's lots of little steps. There's too many of them and we've lost our intuition. So the art of writing a program is we don't want to have to do a lot of work. So that's too much work to add two numbers together. And we also want to make sure at the end that our program's correct and makes sense and we can read it and we know what it's doing. So, although in the early days everyone wrote machine code programs like this, it's called machine code, because this is what the microprocessor understands, it's the language of the microprocessor, after a while we realized it sucked to write programs like that. Though it's fun, yeah, yeah, you're going to like your lab, but it sucked to write like a big program. <laughs> to write a big program you need a more friendly language to write in. So, the language we're looking at in this course, a higher level language we call it, is called C. C looks like English. You just write it in a file, like a text file. It just looks like words. You write it down, you give it to the computer, you give it to a program called the compiler, and the compiler takes your C program and converts it into machine code. Then you give the machine code to the chip, because the chip understands machine code, doesn't understand C. So we have a program that converts this very easy to understand human thing into something that the computer can understand. When your program's running, you can think it's executing machine code, because it is. But you can also think it's executing C, because at a higher level of abstraction, it is. Both of those things are equally true, and they're both. In it's interesting to be able to have two different views on it. Whichever one's most useful depends on the exact problem you're facing. So I think it's very important as a programmer, because most of this course we're going to be programming in C, but I think as a programmer it's really important to understand the machine and the machine code. It's very unimportant, I reckon, to always understand the level underneath you when you're dealing with abstraction. So sure, know about C, but make sure you understand the memory and how the computer works and everything, because it helps you. Like, uh, I don't know if I told you before, but I'm a ninja warrior. And one thing my master taught me when I was learning as a, uh, an apprentice, I don't know what you call them in Australia, but we call them masters in where I came from, uh, was he taught me how to make swords. And he said, now look, ninjas don't need to make swords. Ninjas use swords. But I think it's very important for a ninja sorry, sword master to also know how to make a sword because it makes you a better fighter or better, no, a better writer if, if you have a sword that you've made yourself. And I think computing's like that. You don't need to know machine code to write in C, but it makes you a much more awesome programmer if you know the level underneath. And certainly, when other unis send assassins here, like other lecturers here, to kill us, as often happens, Sydney Uni in particular, and I'm facing them off with my sword and they've got their sword, I know I'm okay, because he didn't make his sword. Yeah? <laughs> he comes from, I'm not saying Sydney, the people from other unis, hypothetically elsewhere in the world, they're using swords that other people have made for them. They don't even understand how the sword works. <laughs> I laugh. I fight them left-handed. <laughs> okay, that was my right hand. <laughs> no wonder I always win. Okay, now, 
The other advantage of knowing how things work at the more fundamental level is if you ever need to, you can go to that level. Like, suppose you were sucked through a time warp back to the land of Queen Victoria, and you had to build a computer. And you knew how to program in... Why would you need to build a computer? That is the dumbest question I've ever heard. <laughs> you just... You, you need one, man. How can you live without one of these things? So, you... you so, you're in trouble because you don't have... You don't have the internet. You don't have electricity. If you only know how to program C, your stuff. But if you know how computers work, you can make your own computer. You can make a hydraulic computer, a clockwork computer, and a gas-powered computer, okay? You could go back and build it if you understand what's going on. I think it's really good if you understand the level below you so you can reconstruct. All right, now I'm going to teach you this language C. And we're going to do it in the world's fastest time. We've got like 15 minutes. I've opened a terminal on my laptop. All right, I'm going to write a C program using a very, very simple editor called um, Picker. And I'll call my program first. First.c. It ends with a dot C because that's how, I tell the, that's how I tell myself that I've put a C program in. Um, I'm going to write the world's smallest and simplest C program, and then I'm going to show you how we turn it into machine code. And that's called, does anyone know the process of calling a program into machine code is called? Compiling. It's called compiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get the compiler. Here, our compiler is called GCC. So I'm going to get GCC, the compiler. It's going to convert my C program into machine code, and then I'm going to tell the computer to run the program. And it's going to run it. And it's just like a program you'd spend money for, except we wrote it for free ourselves. It won't be quite as good as a program you'd spend money for. Now, C programs always start with a function called main. So I'm going to say int. Can you see that? It does look small to me. You can? All right. Int main. The name of the function is main. A function takes stuff in and puts something out, like the toaster. What did the toaster take in? What did it put out? Toast. Okay. A function takes in stuff and puts stuff out. This function, what it puts out is something called an int. An int, does anyone know what an int means? It means a number. It's short for integer. But because the early day people that wrote programming languages didn't like typing, because it hurt their fingers. Early keyboards had needles in the keys, and you could only type a few letters at a time. So instead of using the word integer, which doesn't make sense. Yeah, if you're talking about an integer, why would you call it integer? They called it an int. We can only be lucky they didn't call it a floop or something. Main, because it's the name of the function, main, the main function. Here's the inputs to the function. They go inside the brackets. We'll talk more about the syntax next week. Um, the main function, the central function, the main function of the whole program always has the same input, so I'll just type them quickly. Int uh, 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 c, comma, char, star, arg v, brackets. All right, that's just syntactic gobbledygook. That just says it's taking two things in. One's an int and one's a char. Well, one's actually a <laughs> something else that's complicated. And it's going to return an integer at the end. The end, um, pointing with my fingers, you can't see that. This int here says the function puts out, not a piece of toast, it puts out a number. How does it put it out? Well, in our machine code program, we put it out, we just printed it, didn't we? We did a seven to print it out. That's how we returned it. In C, you return it by just typing the word return. Inside the toaster, <coughs> There's a return toast function that pops the toast up. And we're going to return a number. It's expecting a number. Let's give it the number 1 to make it happy. Oh, let's give it a better number. Let's return the number 42. So this function, when it runs, is just going to return the number 42. Now I've written my first C program. I've just saved it. Now I'm going to compile it. Do you remember the name of the compiler? GCC. GCC. Now I've got to type some magic after GCC because I'm turning on all these special options it's going to use to make your life easier and better. And they are minus wall, minus where or. Minus capital O. <laughs> I'll tell you what all that means later on. But now we've got a supercharged GCC. It's about to compile. And it's going, wow, look at all those extra things you're telling me. I'm going to do the best compiling job ever. Actually, I can tell you what those things mean. Negative wall, the negative W says, I'm telling it something about what warnings to give me. What warnings do I want it to give me? All. all. I want it to tell me every single thing it might have found wrong with my program. Because I know my program is going to have lots of mistakes in it. And if it can find anything, please tell me. You can also tell it not to warn you if you're doing something dumb. Why would you do that? You know you're doing something dumb. It's still important that someone tells you that. W error means if there's a warning, I want you to turn it into an error. So I don't want a namby-pamby warning. If there's something you're not happy with, then raise an error and abort completely. Right, right, right. So I can't even ignore it. Capital O means I'm really happy. Uh, capital O means turn on an optimizer, which you don't need to know about, but that's going to give us more warnings and errors. So it's just going to detect everything that could be wrong and tell me about it. I'm going to, now, what name, what name do I want to make my program? What am I going to call my program that I'm about to run? Hello, world? I'll call it hello. No, I'll call it 
negative little o, this is what the output is, hello, is what my program's called, and what's the name of the thing that it has to compile? First dot c. This will all be on the net, on the lecture notes so you can see what it says. It compiled it, oh, it didn't generate any problems even though I told it to tell me about every single thing that could possibly be wrong, it didn't tell me anything. How lucky is that? That'll never happen ever again. <laughs> ls prints all the names of the files in the directory, so there was first .c, the file I created, and a new file which was just made called hello. What does hello do? Shall we run it? Yes. It's going to return the number one, did I, 42. Did I tell it to print it out? No. no. That was a bit of an oversight on my part. So as I run it, it's just, yeah, woohoo. It told the computer 42, the computer said, yeah, I don't care. You didn't tell me to do anything with it. So what if we wanted to print something out? What should we print out? Oh, yeah, toast. Toast is good. All right. Uh, now, what's going to happen when I save this program? Printf is our command for printing things out. We'll see all this in detail next week. I just want you to get used to the whole how I write a program, how I compile it thing. The meaning and the C, we'll look at all the C next week. Um, I'm going to compile it. How do I compile it? Do you remember? Up, 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 and I'm looking for GCC. No, I don't want to change its name. It can still be called Hello. Hello, Toast. And let's get rid of the Hello. <laughs> Other than that, it's exactly the same. Let's compile it. Oh, what happened? Error, error, error. Now, this is, what, this is better. I'm more relaxed now. Because before the errors were there and I just wasn't seeing them, now I'm thinking, whew, life's like it should be. There's a mistake in my program. Um, and I just look carefully in a relaxed state of mind. I don't get freaked out because I'm used to getting errors. I look and think, hmm, are there any clues here about what, I, what particular thing I've done wrong? Implicit declaration of function printf. Implicit means you're just expecting something that's not there. It's, you're implicitly expecting it, but it's, I want an explicit thing. Declaration means telling me about it. So it's saying... You're expecting me to know about the function printf. I've, I've never heard of that function before. Are you sure you're not insane? And I thought, <laughs> oh, yeah, C doesn't know about printf. If you wanted to know about printf, either I've got to write printf myself, which would be annoying, or I'll tell it to use a printf that someone else has already written. And I can do that by this command here, which is, of course, what you always do. You don't want to write print functions yourself to print to the screen. That's a very complicated thing to do. Include studio.h. What does studio stand for? Standard I.O. Why did they say stood I.O. rather than standard I.O.? Needles. Needles. Why did they say I.O. rather than what I.O. stands for? I.O. stands for input output. So this is a standard file, the standard way of doing input and output for a computer. Input means reading from a keyboard. Output means writing to the screen. So we're loading in a file that tells it how to talk to the screen. .h, it's not a .c file, it's a .h file. .h files are called uh, what we call header files. That just contains a whole lot of information about functions, but doesn't actually contain the function. But this will contain the information it needs to know to um, work out uh, how to link with the printf function. So let's see there. Let's see if it compiles. Woohoo! It worked. And now if I go, what was the name of my function again? Let's have a look. ls, it's called toast. Toast is good, RB wiki. Ah, okay. Now, your programs will always look like this. You'll probably always have slash include, hash include, studio.h at the top, and you'll always have some printfs, and you'll always have an int main, and you'll always have a return at the end, and it's really what goes in the middle here that makes it interesting. Um, what was the problem with my output there, by the way? Yeah, it printed out toast is good, but it didn't drop to the next line, so when the, the computer then printed out my prompt, printed out right next to it, I want it to drop to the next line after printing toast is good. Dropping to the next line is backslash n. That means go to the next line. So when it prints a backslash n, it drops to the next line. Uh, oh, I didn't compile it again, did I? I'm running the program, but I was running the machine code. Yeah, Toast is the machine code. I've got to recompile it to make the machine code again. So now I'm producing a new version of Toast, and now I'm running it by typing Toast. All right, Toast is good. Drop to the next line, so everything's cool. So this is a standard program. It's a program that does something, but it's an ugly program. We've got a correct program, but an ugly program. How do I make it beautiful? Well, in this case, there's not much to make it beautiful, but what does it really need that I haven't given it? A comment. If you put a comment in a program, it's something that the computer, the compiler, ignores. So why would you put something in the program that the compiler ignores? For other humans. It's not a message to the compiler, it's a message to other humans. It's also a message to you when you try and read what you've done and you can't remember what you've done. So at the top, you'd say something like, we call it a header comment. 
uh, comments begin with slash slash, you'd say, by Richard Buckland. Date, whatever it is. I should put the real one in because I'll never come back and change it. What's today's date? 3rd of March, 2nd of March, 2011. And then I should say what the program does. What does it do? Demo program for 1917. Prince A, important. That should be N. Message about toast. Okay, that's my program.